I'm going to start on page 7 and 8 uh, in your books tonight. Ten points of comparison between the patriarchal mosaic and Christian ages. I will say that uh, if you look at all of those introductory pages, I'm not going to go through every one of them. Uh, they rehearsed to a certain extent a lot of what uh, Brother Gallagher went through. And so you can read those on your own uh, and kind of remind yourself of what he was saying. Uh, but there are a lot of the material that I'm going to go through, of course. And these ten points of comparison are uh, pretty important. As we noted, it lasted about 2,500 years. Um, and that would be taking the dates of Bishop Usher, uh, the creation being about 4,000, uh, and then going to the time of uh, Mount Sinai, but during this period of time, God spoke to uh, the patriarchs. Uh, in Hebrews 1, in verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in, in times past unto the fathers by the prophets that unto the fathers would certainly include that period of patriarchy. Now, for some reason that's not coming through, but we'll see if we uh, can get it to. Patriarchal. Look at the word for just a minute. Patri. P A T R I comes from our means father. Um, then the second part of that patriarchal is actually RK. A-R-C-H-E, and it means rule, rule, R-U-L-E. So patriarch, father rule. You have the suffix A-L, patriarchal, and that means pertaining to. And this has worked so well up until tonight. Hmm. And I'm not sure why it's not working, so. So, when you got patriarchal, you're actually dealing with pertaining to father rule, as opposed to matriarchal, archal, or RK again, rule, al, or al, uh, pertaining to matriarch. Now, who would be matriarchs? Mother rule. Now, in one way, I would say probably from the creation until the end of time, we're dealing with matriarchal age. <laughs> because who doesn't know that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world? Uh, 
also there is a great deal, while I'm joking, of course, in relationship to that matriarchal rule, uh, it still has a lot of truth in it because mothers are that important. They, they bring about the, what their children are going to be. And what their children are, that's what the world's going to be. That's what society's going to be. So to a great extent, they do, do rule the world. Uh, and that's one of the great tragedies that has taken place really since World War II is to get the mothers out of the home. And of course all the dads went to war and they needed workers here in the states so what they do they got the mothers out and started and that started a progression where they continued to stay out of the home and gave rise to that um, horrible idea, put it that way, that was seen in, uh, I think it was Hillary Clinton that made the statement, it takes a village to raise a family. No, it takes a dedicated mother. But they wanted children out of the home. Well, and that has continued to lead to the downfall of our society. But this is the patriarchal age. Uh, that age that's dealing with father rule. It is covered from Genesis 1 through Exodus 19. Uh, what takes place in Exodus 20? Something about Ten Commandments? Uh, it seems like it, that's about it. In Exodus chapter 20 is the giving of the Ten Commandments by God to Israel. Uh, and, of course, after that, children of Israel said, we don't want to hear God's word, or God's voice, maybe I should put it that way. And so they told Moses, you go up. And you get this, and you come back and tell us. Uh, but Exodus 20 was the actual giving of that Ten Commandments, and thus the start of the Law of Moses. So it's covered in Genesis 1 through Exodus 19. As Brother Gallagher continued to emphasize in the class, it was the time of a family religion. It was primarily dealing with families. God spoke to the head of the family, or the head of the household, and what God told the head of the household then went out to the rest of the family. You thus had the father, the head of the house, serving as God's prophet. He was God's spokesman to the family. Uh, in Exodus, or Exodus, Genesis 8 and verse 20, Noah built an ark unto the Lord and took every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered uh, burn offerings on the altar. Um, but who did God tell to build the ark? <laughs> Noah. Why 
why not the sons? Why didn't he say, Noah, get all the family together. I want to speak to them. He was the patriarch. And thus, he was God's spokesman to his family to build the ark. In, in Genesis 12 and verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So again, you have God speaking to the patriarch, in this case, Abram. Later his name changed to, of course, Abraham. So it was a time of a family religion in which the father served as the uh, prophet of God. We'll mention the aspect of priesthood in a minute. <laughs> there was during this period of time no written law. It was God speaking to the fathers and they passing it on. But there was no written law. Uh, Moses, however, wrote those first five books of the Old Testament called what? The Pentateuch. Why? Because pente means five. If you remember, there used to be an event in the Olympics called pentathlon in which there were five events that they end now then it's the the ten events uh, that the men participate in but pente means five and so the first five books of the Old Testament are called the Pentateuch even though Moses lived during this time of Sinai a little bit before and after. He lived during that giving of the law, lived under the law of Moses. Much of what he wrote, though, was about patriarchy. Now, how did he know about those things? God revealed them unto him. Now then, I would say that there was probably also word of mouth as far as certain things being handed down by tradition. But God inspired Moses to write them and if there had been any elaboration, any alterations, think that ever happens in word of mouth communications? <laughs> Moses, through inspiration, would have corrected any of those things and would not have allowed. been a game that they played similar to that where you go around everybody sing in a circle and one person tells the next person and it uh, goes around the room and it invariably is so changed because that's what people do they hear it their way and they tell it with their adding something to it, changing it up, uh, different words. That's what man does. And that's why man's words cannot really be relied upon a lot, to a great extent, uh, whether intentional or unintentional. Now, in that game, it's always unintentional. But 
sometimes there are intentional misrepresentations. When God had Moses write it, though, none of that would have taken place because it was inspired. Another evidence of inspiration, absolutely. The blood of animals was offered at sacrifice during that 2,500 year period. Uh, Genesis 31 and verse 54. Then Jacob offered sacrifice and upon the mount and called, called his brethren to eat bread. And they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. So here's Jacob offering a sacrifice unto God. Uh, again, you have Genesis 46 and verse 1. That Israel took his journey and with him all, or with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the Lord of his father Isaac. So again, offering of sacrifices. Now then, in both of those verses, to a certain extent, you see the Father serving as the priest of God. What did a priest do? He offered gifts and sacrifices. Turn over there and somebody read Job chapter 1 and verse 5. Okay. Job offering sacrifices and says, you know, it could be that my sons have sinned. What was he doing? He was offering sacrifices uh, for his children. He was serving as the father of the, of the house, as the priest to offer sacrifices for his family. And that, and Job, let's see, now at Job 1 and verse 5, that's how one of the reasons we know that Job lived during that time of patriarchy. And from the number of years that he lived, we can identify a close time frame as to what time during that period of patriarchy that he lived. That's why generally, if you are reading chronologically through the Bible, you would read Genesis chapters 1 through 11, then you would read Job, and then come back to Genesis chapter 12. Because that would be the time frame in which he lived. Right before Genesis 12. So just before Abraham. Um, I believe if my memory is correct, uh, his the date that is usually given for him is around 2150 B.C. Right. Now, I may, don't hold me to that date, but uh, it seems like that's uh, about the time frame. Yeah, and close enough is good enough in dates. In this period of patriarchy, there was no set day of worship. There are many who now claim that they kept the, the Sabbath uh, during that time frame. 
yet there is no evidence to support that claim. There is plenty of evidence that would disprove that claim, no support of it. The reason that they give it or claim such is because they were Sabbatarians. Now, a Sabbatarian is someone today who believes that we're to, to continue to keep the Sabbath. Yes, that's where they argue it from, that God, six days of creation, God rested on the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Uh, so from that time of creation on through time, we we're supposed to keep the Sabbath, according to them, their arguments. Uh, we'll notice when we get down to the Mosaic period, uh, it was given only to the Jews, never to the Gentile world. And there's no evidence of them keeping the Sabbath prior to that. And let me add, in relationship to the Sabbatarians of today, they like to claim that they keep the Sabbath, but I would almost guarantee you that none of them do. They they will have their worship services on Saturday, but that's all. <laughs> well, <laughs> they have deceived a lot of people. Um, and I call, I say seven, uh, Sabbatarians because we generally think of the Seventh-day Adventists today, but they're Baptist Sabbatarians as well. There's other groups that have that hold to the Sabbath other than just the Seventh Day Adventist. But if you look at all of the laws that are dealing with the Sabbath as far as the law of Moses, they don't keep all of them. Uh, so but there was no uh, as far as patriarchy, and the passages that you see listed here in the book, they really deal with the law of Moses. But notice how it does it, Exodus 31 and verse 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Who's the pronoun ye and you talking about? Who's he, who's he speaking to? Speaking to who? The children of Israel. So when he says, my Sabbath ye shall keep, who's he talking to? children of Israel. And it's a sign between me and who? The world? No, the children of Israel. It shows that that Sabbath law was for Israel, not for others. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commandeth thee to keep the Sabbath day. Did, were all people servants in the land of Egypt? Um, did God bring out all people all over the world through a mighty hand out of Egypt? No. Obviously, he's talking about the children of Israel. And again, because, notice that therefore, what? Because God did this to Israel, keep the Sabbath. It wasn't for everyone. Nehemiah 9, verses 12 through 14. 
Moreover, thou lettest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and made made us known unto them thy, thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. Now then again, we could we want to rub this a little bit more. Uh, we could ask, did God lead everyone in the world through a uh, cloudy pillar and by night a pillar of fire? No. Who did he do that to? Israel. Did he speak from Mount Sinai to all the people or to Israel? Israel. Uh, and notice there in verse 14. Made us known unto them thy holy Sabbaths. Doesn't that indicate to us that it was not known prior to this time? Well, sure it does, because it was not known to them before this. Yes, God had rested on the, sab on the seventh day. But before the law of Moses was given, there was nothing as far as an, an, an observance of that Sabbath day. He made known at Mount Sinai about the Sabbath and their responsibility to keep it holy. So there was no set place of worship or set day of worship. Nor was there any set place of worship. Uh, anywhere they were, they could build an altar. And they could worship. And our book mentions Genesis 8.20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings in, on the altar. Where was he? Hmm. <laughs> we don't really know. Uh, wherever the ark came to rest, he went out and he built an altar. Some mountain. Um, in Genesis 12 and verse 7, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. So again, there was no set place that they had to go to to worship. He became a member of patriarchy by physical birth. You're born into a family, just like anyone else is born into a family. And as a result, you came under that rule of the father, the head of the household. Or it might be, at that time, a grandfather or great-grandfather even, whoever was the head of the household. And however many generations might have been living together. But that father became the head of the household. And you had become a member of that household by physical birth. Now then the Jews, or the Mosaic period. As we noted, it lasted about 1,500 years. And that's rounding it off, I know that, but uh, approximately 1,500 years. During that time, God spoke to or through Moses and by the prophets. Moses also was a prophet of God, but not to distinguish him from the prophets. He was a prophet, but he also was the one who gave the law, and they didn't. In Hebrews 1, and verse 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers 
by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So there's, he spoke during that Mosaic period by the prophets, among other ways. In John 1 and verse 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Let me mention there in uh, John 1 and verse 17, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Does that mean that there is no law under Jesus Christ and that there was no grace and truth under the law of Moses? Of course not. <laughs> Noah found grace. First time it, the word grace is used in the Bible. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, during the time of the Mosaic dispensation, actually, God told Joshua in Joshua uh, chapter 6, I'm going to give you this city. We we're talking about Jericho. That's God's grace. So there was grace during the period of the law of Moses. There was truth during that time. And there is law during the New Testament period. Those terms that he sets forth here are not exclusive one of the other. In fact, the reality is you cannot have grace without having law. You cannot have law without having grace. They are dependent upon each other. You can't have one without the other. Our book has that this new law, and it was a new law that God had given at Mount Sinai, was only for descendants of Shem. I think that's a little misleading. Was it for all of the descendants of Shem? No. Only those of the descendants of Abraham. Now then that's a little misleading also. Why? because it did not include all of the descendants of Abraham. What about uh, Ishmael? Did it include him and his descendants? No. So it was only the descendants of Abraham through his son Isaac, who was the son of promise. Let me also add, since it does not include Ishmael, what about Keturah and her six sons? Now, we know who Keturah was, right? After Sarah died, what happened? Well, Genesis 25 and verse 1, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. It says she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. So the six sons that Keturah had through Abraham, they were not included in the law of Moses. So to say simply it was only for the descendants of Shem, all of these were the descendants of Shem, but the descendants of Shem included a whole lot more than just the Israelites. Abraham's descendants through his son Isaac. Uh, and it was for all of them. It began, uh, it's covered in Exodus chapter 20, 
which we said a while ago was what? Giving you the Ten Commandments. Giving you the law. And continued on through as we see here in our little poorly drawn and diagram to the cross. And in reality it goes on through that first gospel sermon that was to be preached in the name of the risen Christ on that day of Pentecost in Acts 2. So it would be right to say in reality that the law of Moses covered from Exodus chapter 20 to Acts chapter 2. Now then, I'm going to give you a hint. We're not going to talk about it tonight because we don't have time. We'll get to it probably next week if we have time. I think we will. The patriarchal law continued on for the Gentile world to Cornelius in Acts 10th chapter. Now then, I'll set out to prove that later on. But I'm just giving you a hint at this point in time. Uh, it will be on the test. <laughs> so it might be something you need to remember. No. As Brother Gallagher did mention, it was a national religion. You had patriarchally a family religion, while Moses was a national religion dealing with the nation of Israel. Did God exclude and ignore all of the other nations? Obviously not. We talked about that um, last week and looked at all of those. Jethro, the widow, is up to Balaam, Jonah, uh, Herod, all the nations, and then Romans, the first chapter. We looked at all that dealing with and showing that God did not forget all of the other nations, but he dealt specifically with the Israelite nation. While the patriarchal law did not, was not a written law, it was a law given to the fathers through the families, to the families, now then there is a written law, the law of Moses. In that law, and let me just say, this has been disputed many times, but it's still held even by some of those who dispute it, they'll use these, this. So um, it's pretty much accepted. There were 613 commandments, and that supposedly is isolated by rabbinic authorities. Supposedly that uh, corresponded to the number of letters in the Decalogue. What would the Decalogue be? Mentioned a while ago, Deca would have reference to what? Pentateuch was what? Five. Deca would be ten. <laughs> and then the idea of law... Uh, Decalogue would be Ten Commandments. So, supposedly 613 letters in the Decalogue. Our book has 368 thou shalt nots. I could not find that figure anywhere. I did find the figure by, in numerous uh, books of 365 negative laws or thou shalt not. I don't know. <laughs> uh, look at Wikipedia and it gives you a lot of information about this. Um, if you say 365, what does that remind you of? Number of days in a year, the solar year you might 
be more specific. So 365 negative laws. Again, could not find this number 245 thou shalt in any reference work that I could find. I'm not saying it's not there, I'm just saying I, I could not find it. What I did find is 248 positive laws, which they stated corresponds to the number of bones and main organs in the human body. Now then, don't ask me what they considered main organs, because I don't know. And I'm not sure that they would have, have gotten the number of bones in the human body correct. I'm just, that's what they went by. Now then, as I say, this is disputed, these figures. Uh, but I will say that that would be very consistent with the Jewish rabbis to break it down in such a fashion and to have it in such minute detail as this. That would be totally consistent with them. Uh, and the 613 specifically was spoken of by many of the rabbis. So, but it still is a written law. There were a bunch of them. Uh, as I was reading, um, I've forgotten how many they said exact number could not even be performed today. Uh, there's a very small number, the number 77 seems to stick in my mind, but that may be wrong, which they claim they could keep, but nobody was able to. And I'm saying could keep today. What about the rest of them? Well, that was, a lot of them dealt with being in the temple and it didn't exist or doesn't exist. And so they recognize they don't, there's no possibility of keeping them today. Now then, let me just add, if there's no possibility of keeping them today, what does that say of Messiah? Mm hmm. Well, no, well, yes, he's very important. It doesn't say that about him, though. <laughs> well, what it tells us is that the Messiah could not come today. It would be impossible for the Messiah to come today. Why? Because he had to obey the law and fulfill it. And yet they are admitting it's an impossibility because a lot of them don't, cannot be kept. If they cannot be kept, then the Messiah cannot come. He had to already come. Now then, what does that do for Israelites today? Or those who claim to be Israelites today? Well, that's right. He's already come. And that... The uh, fact that he has already come, that takes care of the situation of him coming in the future. And if he has already come, he fulfilled the law and took it out of the way, and it's no longer in existence today. So we'll start there, Lord willing, next week and continue on.